All right. Welcome, everyone. We are, um, I see a lot of people joining right here at the last minute, and I'm uh, ready to go. Welcome to you all. I'm so glad to have you here for another Healer webinar. We've got some interesting topics and some great questions tonight. And just a few announcements. Um, as many of you know, since uh, the whole uh, COVID shutdown, what we've done is taken our Healer webinars that we were doing every month for the Healer Training Community, which is a certification program that's available on healer.com. And we decided to make these webinars free and open to anyone who wanted to join. And I think that's, um, that's been an offering that's been well received. If you really enjoy this webinar and you have other questions, and I think you'll see as we go through the questions uh, later on in the evening, um, there's quite a lot of material in the healer training curriculum, and it's all translated to lay terminology. It's not designed for clinicians, though we have uh, 100 or, or maybe even close to 200 clinicians as part of the program who uh, find that they really benefit from it. But it's really designed to be accessible for anyone, whether you're a patient or a caregiver of a patient, a dispensary agent, an industry professional. Uh, in that curriculum, we have all of the past webinars which have been recorded and posted and uh, timestamps so you can go to the topic or the question that's interesting to you, uh, as well as a nice easy online learning module that covers all the cannabis basics, the dosing, the whole uh, curricula just devoted to CBD. Uh, so there's a lot of great content there and I welcome you to check it out. Where else can we, uh, a few other announcements before we dive in. It is October and so in Maine and probably in most other parts of uh, the Northern Hemisphere, it is time to harvest the outdoor cannabis. And uh, it's just such a joy for the people to have the opportunity to do that. And such an incredible reminder that so many of my patients are able to grow a year's supply of their medicine in their backyard for a very low cost. And it, um, it still saddens me that there's so many parts of the world where this is not allowed. And I always wanna remind everyone, uh, whether you live in an in a area where you can or can't do this, that our work is not done. And this is really a basic human right for anyone to be able to put a cutting or a seed in their backyard and produce their own medicine. And I encourage you with whatever resources you have uh, to support the decriminalization and legalization of home cultivation. I think that's a basic priority uh, for everyone. Um, so if you have any ways of doing that, please promote that. And then a few other uh, little tidbits about cannabis harvest, some things that I think a lot of folks um, may not realize. Uh, number one is um, most people when they harvest their cannabis will let it dry and there's all different techniques for curing it before it might be inhaled and that's uh, typically inhaled via smoking. But it is a really interesting experience if you have the opportunity to try uh, vaporizing fresh cannabis flowers. And so you don't need to let it cure or dry. It, uh, it might take a little bit longer to warm up or a little bit of a higher temperature. But if you have the chance to try that, it's really a, a, a delightful um, taste and smell experience and, uh, and a, a distinct effect um, based on uh, my experience and others that have uh, tried it and reported that to me. So give that a shot if you, if you haven't before. And then um, uh, it's, uh, what else can I say here? Lots of exciting things happening with Healer. So uh, as many of you know, about a month ago, Healer launched our hemp-based products, CBD and CBDA. And we've been getting a lot of questions about when we're going to release our THC containing medical cannabis products in Maine, as well as a lot of inquiries about if there's any opportunity to invest with our company. And so uh, I'm just so happy to announce that our THC products were bottled this week and they will become available next week uh, at our Brunswick, Maine facility and soon thereafter in other facilities around the state. It's, um, it's just something I've been dreaming about for years or maybe a decade to have my own formulary available to my own patients. And so we have uh, a number of different products right now in drop form and W in capsules 
soon uh, and, uh, and we'll have other products coming down uh, the pipeline. So um, that's so exciting. And if you are interested in um, investing in the company, we do have a, a small amount of opportunity left for investment in uh, the, the current uh, fundraising round uh, that we're just closing up. And I would love to have the healer training community more involved. So if, if anyone wants to know more about that, you can uh, just send a, a chat message to Simone and she'll take down your information and we'll get back to you with those details. I think those are all of my announcements. Somebody uh, jump in if there's anything more. Oh, I'll say one other thing about the um, fresh herb in the vaporizer. Uh, an another thing that always comes to mind uh, this time of year, since it's also apple season here in Maine and my family, we typically go to an orchard and pick lots of apples and dry them and do all sorts of things with them. One of the things you can do with an apple that works so well is turn it into a cannabis smoking device. And I don't have one to show you for an example, but um, uh, just another fun uh, fall activity. If you just kind of twist off the stem and insert uh, something that's sharp like a pen halfway down and then halfway the side, uh, you can do it with any fruit, but an apple works extremely well. And it's just uh, humidifies uh, the smoke and kind of moistens and cools it off, gives it a really lovely taste. So celebrate fall with your homegrown cannabis if you can. Now we have a lot of studies to cover tonight and uh, there were even many that I wanted to include that I didn't. Uh, as many of you know, last month we really took a deep dive into uh, cannabis and pregnancy and kind of gathered a bunch of studies that had been presented over the last uh, six months or so, there were, there were several. And tonight we are going to cover one more, but let me uh, share my screen. And I will get uh, this, uh, the topics up. Here we go. So we have uh, six, six studies that I'm going to present and some I'll go through rather quickly so we can catch all the uh, questions and comments and stories at the end. But uh, we're going to start with THCA in rodent seizure models and then uh, move into a human study on the impact of cannabis and cancer immunotherapy very important one that impacts uh, clinical practice directly. We'll cover one more study that came out on prenatal cannabis, uh, cannabis exposure and childhood outcomes. Uh, and then back to the animal data for CBDA in a model of Rett syndrome, which is a rare neurologic condition. And then another animal model of combinations of CBD, CBG, and fish oil in bowel inflammation. And then finally, a uh, few uh, um, pearls from a report on the spiritual use of cannabis. Oops, here we go. Okay, now any of you that know my work know that I get very excited about the acidic cannabinoids. I'm always scouring uh, the literature for evidence about what's going on with THCA and CBD and the other acidics because I've observed in my clinical practice that this is a really uh, special and distinct aspect of the cannabis plant. And so um, it was about four years ago, I started communicating with Jonathan Arnold, a researcher out of Australia, and uh, telling him about what I was seeing in my clinic with THCA. Um, and we later published some of those cases in epilepsy and behavior. And he uh, has the opportunity to do animal research. So we had this very infrequent dialogue about THCA, can it even get into the brain? What's its anti-convulsant properties uh, and uh, so forth. And uh, so he just published, uh, him and his colleagues just published uh, this uh, really well done study. Uh, even though it doesn't give us a lot of answers, it gives us some, but it uh, asks a lot more questions. So they looked at Delta 9 THCA in three different models of seizures, mice models of seizures. One is a model of Dravet syndrome, which is a sodium channel um, genetic defect that causes seizures. And um, the next is a, a more classic seizure model called the six hertz threshold model. And then finally, the mouse maximal electroshock threshold model, which is a model of generalized tonic clonic seizures. And so um, let's just dive in and look at the results. Uh, they did a great job with the images so we could see the results. Now, um, what they, they had a few different things that they used in the study. One was uh, what they called pure THCA, but there is no such thing as pure THCA. Anytime there's even the pure standard of THCA stored in optimal conditions, it will contain at least a small quantity of THC. They're just in equilibrium with each other. You can't uh, get all the THC out of there. But their pure THCA was actually 
uh, greater or equal to 99.5% pure. So that's pretty pure. They tested that in this seizure model. This is the Dravet model. And basically they heat up the um, containers of the animals to the point uh, where they have a seizure. And they can pretty dependably do that. And uh, what you see here was just a vehicle, meaning uh, no drug, just the carrier of the drug um, that would be injected into the abdomen of the animal. You can see that uh, the temperature at which a seizure occurred was about 40.5 degrees centigrade. And all three of these doses of THCA did not change the seizure threshold. So no anti-seizure effect at two milligrams per kilogram, which would be on the low side for mice, uh, 30 milligrams per kilogram or 100 milligrams per kilogram. But, uh, oh, well, let's take a look at this. Now, what happened with that pure THCA? Did it get into the blood? Did it get into the brain? And interestingly, the answer is yes. At 30 milligrams per kilogram dose, you can see that there was about a 20 uh, microgram per milliliter level in the plasma, in the blood, and then um, about a almost a two milligram, uh, excuse me, almost a two nanogram per, um, per milligram uh, potency in the brain. So this is a very low potency, but they were able to detect it in the brain. And then the higher dose uh, had a much higher plasma level and a slightly higher brain level. So does THCA get into the brain? Yes, it does. Uh, it is more polar as of a molecule than THC, so it's more water-soluble, less fat-soluble. That's why THCA gets absorbed so much better, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as well. So um, then uh, they looked at uh, their kind of artisanal-like THCA preparation, which was about 95% THCA and 5% THC. And this was given orally, it wasn't injected, at uh, just two doses, 250 milligrams of THCA per kilogram of the animal's body weight, or 2,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And uh, what they found uh, was, um, well, a couple things here. First of all, um, did it change the seizures? Uh, yes, it actually did. It seemed to make the seizures more intense, both doses. So basically, by intensity of seizure in this model, they look at if the hind legs are involved in the seizures or just the forelegs. And so both of these doses of THCA intensified the seizure in this model. And then also the highest dose of THCA decreased the survival uh, significantly over the course of 30 days. So in this model, which is just one model, this very high dose of THCA, which contains a, a very high dose of THC as well, um, uh, you know, maybe not a very high one, but quite high. And that, that was not good in this model of Dravet syndrome. And this is not a, you know, none of these animal models, I want to say, are perfect representations of what's occurring in a human. They're just a place to start looking. And, and that's interesting because we've certainly had Dravet patients that have responded well to uh, THCA. And uh, he certainly cites that and mentions it in the paper. Now, moving on to a different model. This is the six hertz threshold model of psychomotor seizures and um, they use their artisanal like THCA formula. It's interesting, this one is 97%. And the reason for that is because they did this experiment first. And so over time, their THCA preparation changed from 97% pure to 95% pure, just because that's what time does to THCA. Even in uh, cold conditions, it will convert very slowly, but at room temperature, uh, a little bit faster. And so, um, this is the uh, critical current uh, on the y-axis here at which 50% of the mice seized. So basically, if you can crank the current way up and you don't get a seizure, uh, then that means it's an effective anticonvulsant. And this is a, a, a control of valproic acid, a standard anti-epileptic drug. And so what you can see here is that the, the very low dose of THCA formula didn't change the seizure threshold. Not, neither did the 10 milligram per kilogram or the, um, but the 100 milligram per kilogram did. Not quite as much as 300 milligram per kilogram of valproic acid, uh, but it did have an anticonvulsant effect in this, uh, in this model of seizures. So, uh, so that's um, one positive result with THCA. So then the question was, 
okay, well, this formula that contains THCA and THC worked in the seizure model. Which one was it, the THCA or the THC? That happens to be a question I keep asking myself again and again, because any time that I give a low dose of THCA to someone and it helps with their seizures, I know that that person is getting a tiny dose of THC, but tiny doses of THC are active in the brain. And there's been rodent studies that have shown doses so low you wouldn't believe it, 0.002 milligrams per kilogram of THC can change all sorts of signaling events in the brain and, and turn on protective mechanisms. So it's a great question to ask. Is it the THCA? Is it the THC? Is it the combination? And they compare that against 100% pure THC. And so what you can see here are the combinations of THCA and THC. And basically, where there's a little star, that means that it was a statistically significant change from baseline. And so basically this THCA artisanal formula where THCA and THC were combined, uh, that had an anticonvulsant effect. And then double the dose of that had an anticonvulsant effect, a stronger one. But the same dose of THC without the THCA did not have an anticonvulsant effect. So this chart here shows you that it was the combination that worked, not the pure THC. Then if we uh, look over here uh, just to see what, how much THC was getting into the plasma, into the blood, and you can see basically that uh, when given alone, we had this much THCA getting into the blood, but when given in combination with THCA, the blood levels of THC went up. I think that's an important point because a lot of people are taking THCA and THC together and uh, essentially what we uh, think is going on there is that the THCA is competing for the breakdown uh, of THC and it's allowing more THC to stay in the blood at higher levels for longer. And then of course you can see here that the THCA was also, also measurable in the blood. Nothing too interesting there. But what is uh, interesting is uh, the levels of THC and THCA in the brain. And I think this is very important. Uh, so THC was not detected in the brain at any level, not when it was given by itself at six milligrams per kilogram, not when it was given uh, at, um, with THCA, 194 milligrams per kilogram plus six. And, and I misspoke a little bit. They could, they could detect a tiny signal of THC in the brain, but below the limit of quantification. So they weren't able to even use their equipment to figure out how much was in there. So um, not a lot going on with THC in the brain there. And certainly in this model, again, even though at low levels, the THCA did make it into the brain like it did on the previous slide. Um, then they tested their so-called 100% pure THCA formula. And uh, that's at 200 milligrams per kilogram, so approximately the same dose as this positive result. And you can see it did nothing. So what they showed here was that pure THC didn't change the seizure threshold, pure THCA didn't change the seizure threshold, but the combination of the two of them did. And, uh, and, and it, that combination is required even though Barely any THC is getting into the brain, really no, none detectable. So, you know, this just opens the mystery. What's happening here? Is everything that occurs in response to cannabis dosing a chemical event? Are there other mechanisms, uh, electromagnetic or energetic, uh, that might be at play here? Or are some of these ultra low doses uh, just uh, physiologically active, way below what we can measure? Let's take a look at the next model. So this is the mouse maximal electroshock threshold model of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. This is the model that was studied uh, back in 1979 uh, by Carler and uh, Turkanis, uh, which was uh, the first report of the anticonvulsant effects of THCA. And, um, and in that model, THCA was effective at 200 milligrams per kilogram, but uh, they did not test for the, the amount of THC that was present in their formula back then. So, uh, so let's see what happened in this uh, kind of somewhat of a repeat of that old study. Well, you can see a variety of combinations of THCA and THC tested out here. The gray bar is the control. Just half a milligram per kilogram of uh, THC 
reduced the seizure threshold. Oh, excuse me, increased the seizure threshold. So when the bar is shorter, it means the animal is seizing with less electrical activity. So THCA had a pro-seizure, pro-convulsant effect. Now that same dose of THC that had a pro-convulsant effect, what, when combined with THCA at about, uh, you, you know, at, at, um, so that would be like a 20 to one ratio, it did not have a pro-convulsant effect. So in this case, it seems like THCA mitigated the pro-convulsant effect of THC. I know it's getting stranger and stranger. Uh, a, higher, a much higher dose of THC also had a pro-convulsant effect. And again, the combination with THCA mitigated that pro-convulsant effect. So strange. None of them had an anti-convulsant effect at the doses tried, but it's very interesting that THCA mitigated that pro-convulsant effect of THC. When they tried the pure THCA, they found a slight potentiation of seizure, meaning, meaning a slight pro-convulsant effect that was statistically significant. So now we've got pure THC making things worse in the seizure model, pure THCA making things worse in the seizure model, but put them together and they don't make things worse. Wow. So let, let's see what else is happening here. So um, this pro-convulsant effect of THC was consistent with another study that reported there were these biphasic effects of THC on the severity of seizures in this model where low doses were pro-convulsant but higher doses were anti-convulsant. So it was already known that THC could be pro-convulsant in this model, but it wasn't known that THCA could mitigate that. Wow. So what's the summary here? You know, just to review, purified THCA did not change that Dravet model. The highest dose of oral THCA with that little bit of THC in there actually worsened the intensity of seizures in the Dravet model. THCA was anticonvulsant in another model, the six hertz model. Neither dose of THCA, THC mixture affected uh, that last model we showed, the maximal electroshock, but when you separated them out individually, they did have a pro-convulsant effect. And then uh, 30 milligrams per kilogram and 200 milligrams per kilogram of THCA injected into the abdomen of rodents uh, did produce levels that were detected in the brain. So this does cross the blood brain, blood brain barrier. And, and I think another point that's important there is it crossed the blood brain barrier um, in a model of seizures. And so seizures can change the function of the blood brain barrier. And that's one of the things that we've been suspecting in our human patients. Well, well, you know, while, while researchers like these were kind of telling us on the sidelines, hey, we don't think this stuff gets into the brain, uh, we, we were responding that, well, it might not normally get into the brain and maybe not in your control rodents, uh, but our seizure patients have uh, a lot of inflammation in their brain and their blood brain barrier is probably acting differently. This opens a lot more questions. So there were synergistic effects of THC and THCA. What, was this just a pharmacokinetic effect, meaning is it because THCA raised the plasma levels, but not the brain levels of THC? Interesting there. Or was it a pharmacodynamic effect, meaning how they function in the body, did they work together? Now, there was a recent report that we covered a few months ago uh, showing us that THCA behaved as a positive allosteric modulator. And I think that's worth commenting on. So uh, a lot of us know that CBD can decrease the adverse effects of THC. CBD can, can make THC seem a little bit less intense. And it does that by turning down the volume of the signal of THC at our CB1 receptor. CB1 is that little antenna on the surface of the cells that responds to THC and responds to our endocannabinoids. So CBD is actually a negative allosteric modulator of the CB1 receptor. It, when, it doesn't stimulate it directly, it doesn't block it directly, but when something else stimulates it in the presence of CBD, it, uh, it has a less of an intense effect. It kind of just turns down the volume on that receptor. Well, THCA has now been shown to do the opposite. THCA is a positive allosteric modulator, which means it's likely that even in the absence of THC, which is impossible, but, but even when acting just uh, in uh, relation to our own endocannabinoid production, the presence of THCA would turn on the signal of that CB1 receptor even stronger. And that's something that's been searched for in the synthetic cannabinoid uh, world for a while because it's thought that if you were able to selectively augment the endocannabinoid system, 
only in the areas where it's currently active, that would have a therapeutic effect that would be more tolerable and maybe more uh, specific than just globally turning them all on with something like THC. So THCA might uh, interact with the endocannabinoid system in this really elegant way as a positive allosteric modulator. And I think that's significant when it comes to seizures. Other questions, is THCA even stable enough for us to use in our patients? I find it to be extremely finicky. It works, uh, sometimes too much doesn't work, sometimes too little doesn't work, sometimes it works for a while and then it changes, and we wonder is it the patient that's changing or is it just that the formula has changed? And it's probably the latter, so there's a lot of challenges with THCA. Uh, anyone that's using it for seizures should definitely keep it in the fridge, if not the freezer. Uh, and um, what about these biphasic effects of THC that were reported in this study? Uh, would they have seen those with THCA if they had the resources to test um, several more doses? As you saw in the study, they just tested two or three doses with each model, uh, but really we should have gone, uh, you know, ideally they could have gone way down to the tiny, tiny dose range and way up to the high dose range, um, but uh, resources are always limited in scientific research. So a lot more questions, but uh, maybe some of you are as excited as I am about THCA. Uh, just to quote the authors, our study's lowest dose corresponds to the highest dose reported by Sulak et al. in a case series of pediatric patients. It is possible that lower doses of THCA might be effective given we have observed low dose effects of THC, now those are very low dose, 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, against hyperthermia induced seizures in that Dravet model. Uh, furthermore, very low doses of THCA have been reported to reduce nausea and vomiting in rodents. And by the way, those doses of THCA are, are tiny that uh, reduce nausea and vomiting in rodents, again, in this range, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. So the effects of lower doses of THCA could be explored in a future study, and I hope that they do that. All right, enough on seizures. Let's move on to cancer. This is an important clinically relevant information about cannabis consumption used by cancer patients during immunotherapy correlating with a poor clinical outcome. So uh, just a little background information. And this is data from uh, David Mieri and his lab in Israel. And a year, maybe two years ago, but not long ago, uh, they published a retrospective uh, case series of looking at patients that were receiving immunotherapy for cancer, some of which used cannabis, some of which didn't use cannabis. And uh, what they saw was that the immunotherapy was less effective in the cannabis group. So immunotherapy... Uh, can mean a lot of things. But when it comes to cancer, it typically is a treatment that activates the body's immune system. Uh, and in activating the immune system, it, it's, the immune system is better able to target and kill and remove the cancer. Uh, but there's often a lot of uh, side effects because there's just increased inflammation in the body. So it can cause uh, inflammatory changes in the colon and the, the small intestine and the skin and the joints and, and, and the lungs. Uh, and some of those um, side effects uh, can leave a scarring and, and permanent damage and others are, are temporary. So this was another study to look at that data. Now that last one uh, was retrospective and it, it was just using one drug, nivolumab. And uh, this study looked at uh, several different types of cancer, as you can see here, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and a couple others, uh, all metastatic. Um, and then uh, the immunotherapies that were given were the anti-PD-1 drugs. So that's pembrolizumab, uh, nivolumab, ipilimumab, and uh, nivolumab uh, together. And then there's also these anti pdl one uh, treatments, Dervalumab and Atezolizumab. <laughs> Did all right with those. Um, and so th this, these are whole classes of drugs. They all end in this umab. Uh, and anyone that's uh, receiving cancer uh, um, immunotherapy with any of these drugs and concurrently using cannabis needs to know about these results and, and what we make out of them. So uh, they, what they basically did was allow uh, people to kind of um, put themselves into groups of cannabis non-users and users. And so there were 68 non-users and 34 users. And these two groups were not perfectly matched. And I'm just showing some of the matching data here. It, they didn't have enough numbers uh, to exclude people to really get two groups that were the same uh, based on so many uh, criteria, but, but similar, certainly. 
if you, if you look at uh, these two columns here and these two columns here, pretty similar. I think you know one of the bigger differences was that the cannabis non-users uh, had uh, less frequent a low lymphocyte counts. Now lymphocytes are a type of immune cell that are very good at fighting cancer. Um, it's, uh, and there, there's a measure that I'm a much stronger proponent of called the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So it's not just about the total number of lymphocytes, in my opinion, and there's a huge amount of data to support this, but it's actually about the ratio of the neutrophils, one type of immune cell that can actually promote cancer progression and the lymphocytes, which is, would be more of the anti-cancer type of immune cells, but they didn't report that. I, I sent a, an email to the author, but I don't think that he had a chance to respond yet. So, um, so anyways, uh, there were some differences there, but it, overall it was pretty close. Now out of these 30, um, 32 cannabis users, did I get that right? Or maybe it was 34. I'm not sure if that's the typo there, uh, but it looked like eight used only cannabis oil, 20 used only flour, and six used combined oil and flour. Maybe uh, two didn't report what they used, but no other information on the type of cannabis they used, how they were, you know, like what was their usage pattern or uh, their dosage or anything like that, which is really unfortunate because I think that's the resolution of data that's the most important to us and the people, and the people we're working with. Okay, so we're just gonna get straight to the point here. And, and you, you saw it in the headline that basically the cannabis users had, first of all, uh, faster progression so uh, these are basically in gray showing uh, the time it took uh, for uh, progression. And, um, and the median is outlined by this dashed line here. So gray is the non-cannabis users and pink or salmon colored is the cannabis users. And so basically the median time to cancer progression in the cannabis users was 3.4 months, but it was 13 months in the non-users. So it really looks like uh, the cannabis users had faster progression. And then if you look at odds of survival, we see something very similar. The median, which is not the average, it's kind of the middle value. Uh, the, the median of the cannabis users was 6.4 months in terms of how long it took them before they died, how long they lived, I should say, uh, while undergoing treatment. Uh, whereas the median of the uh, non-cannabis users was 28.5 months. That's a really big difference there. So this is certainly something to pay attention to. Now, uh, there were less adverse effects in the cannabis group, and that's not a surprise because cannabis is so good at treating a lot of these anti-inflammatory, uh, uh, excuse me, a lot of these inflammatory symptoms. But it's probably too strong of an anti-inflammatory if it's inhibiting the immune system in ways that prevent it from targeting uh, the cancer. Cannabis users were also associated with lower number of immune-related uh, adverse effects. And then the authors commented, of note, it has been shown that patients with advanced melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, or non-small cell lung cancer treated with nivolumab who developed treatment-related inflammatory adverse effects were likely to result in significantly prolonged five years survival odds. So in other words, these, these cancer immunotherapies cause these really uh, challenging side effects, but the people that get the side effects are more likely to survive. At least some of this data shows that. And so it's, it's kind of a catch 22. And I think the, um, you know, kind of the art here is how can we mitigate the side effects just enough to allow the person uh, to continue the treatment, right? Because if they're too strong, they have to stop the treatment. And I've seen that in several of my patients that they're, they get colitis, they're bleeding in their colon, or they can't breathe because their lungs are so inflamed, they have to stop the treatment. Well, that's not going to be good for their uh, odds of survival. So how do you kind of mitigate these side effects in a delicate way to keep them in treatment but not suppress the immune response. And there's, there's no answer for that, but we can, we can talk about what our thoughts were, what our thoughts are. Now, the, uh, this study also looked at the endocannabinoid levels in the people uh, that were using both uh, cannabis and immunotherapy and, and just the plain immunotherapy users. Uh, the serum endocannabinoid and endocannabinoid-like lipids measured on cancer patients before and after immunotherapy. Uh, so uh, the baseline levels, no, no significant difference. So whether they were cannabis users at the beginning versus non-users at the beginning of the treatment, roughly the same endocannabinoid levels. 
Um, and then uh, ca the cannabis use over time didn't really change that, but immunotherapy did. So both groups, there was an impact on uh, their endocannabinoid levels uh, due to the immunotherapy. And then there was an association with treatment success with four compounds. Uh, this had nothing to do with the cannabis exposure. So now they're just looking at the endocannabinoid system activity of these individuals. And that was able to uh, partially predict treatment success. And I didn't really get into that data very much because I, I don't think it's that relevant um, for a number of reasons, including that um, sometimes those endocannabinoids just fluctuate so much throughout the day. It really depends uh, whether they've eaten or how much they've slept and what time of day it is. Uh, and so I, I don't think those numbers are worth uh, going into uh, in detail here. So the conclusion is that a high level of caution in patients receiving any of these drugs we have many unanswered questions about the dose, the timing, and what's very interesting is the uh, steroid sparing effect because um, there's surprisingly little data on the impact of something like prednisone, which is a very strong uh, uh, corticosteroid anti-inflammatory drug. So if someone's getting one of these uh, immunotherapies and they do develop a colitis or a pneumonitis, uh, sometimes instead of stopping the therapy, they'll try to continue the therapy and give prednisone, which would be immunosuppressive. And, um, and there's just surprisingly little data, and I've really scoured the literature for it, on the impact of prednisone or other corticosteroids on these treatment outcomes. So we now actually know more probably about the impact of cannabis on immunotherapy than we do kind of a, a common mainstream approach to these side effects, uh, which would be prednisone. And that's that's surprising. But in my mind, what I've been thinking is, wow, prednisone is a stronger immunosuppressant than cannabis. If we can delicately use cannabis to mitigate these symptoms in, in some of these patients, uh, maybe we're preventing them from having to either go on prednisone or stop the treatment, and that would be a success. But no, we don't really know. We don't have enough data. So I don't think that this is enough to say it's a black and white contraindication. If you're using one of these agents, you can use zero cannabis at all. I, I really don't think we have enough information to say that, but I would use it under the guidance of a physician or a clinician with extreme caution. And what I'm recommending to my patients, what I have been even since the study came out, is to always use the, the very lowest amount of cannabis uh, and not to use it at all within the few days or one week prior to and after the immunotherapy infusion, if at all possible. And then, uh, so just to really hold back on the cannabis, use it as minimally as possible. And then if these really severe inflammatory symptoms do occur, we can, we can use just a little bit more cannabis. Uh, and, um, and if that's not effective, then of course they either go on steroids or stop the treatment. So, but it's, it's really touchy and um, it's just, there's, there's a human side of this as well because you have people that are not sleeping, they're in pain, uh, they're dealing with a terminal diagnosis, they're uh, doing their best to uh, kind of connect with and recapitulate with their family and also to connect with themselves and to connect spiritually. There's just so many dimensions to helping someone with one of these uh, advanced malignancies and uh, each of them has different goals. Some of them really want to live, and some of them just want to have better quality of life until the time they die. And, and sometimes it's mixed, and some people are, are scared, and they don't know it, and cannabis can help them overcome their fear and then, and then figure out what their real goals are. So it's, it's very involved, but I, I, you know, I think the take-home message here is a lot of caution uh, using cannabis with any cancer immunotherapy. All right. Moving on, and I'm not going to spend too long on this one. And uh, thank you, Michael Stewart. I got your, uh, your write-up of this, and so I'm going to make some comments about that as well. But here's another study that um, looked at basically moms that had been ex uh, exposing their uh, fetuses, uh, pregnant moms exposing the fetus to cannabis versus moms who did not do that. And then they also divided it into... Um, those who knew about their pregnancy while using cannabis, or and then those who stopped uh, once they found out they were pregnant, they stopped using cannabis. And so basically 11,000, almost 12,000 children age 9 to 11, as well as their parent or caregiver, uh, were um, surveyed or interviewed. And um, 
what they were looking for were a specific set of outcomes uh, related to psychopathology. So they were, um, they were exploring whether cannabis use, cannabis exposure prenatally was associated with psychotic-like experiences, internalizing uh, behaviors, externalizing behaviors, uh, changes in their attention, their thinking, and their social problems, as well as the impact on their cognition, their sleep, their birth weight, gestational age, body mass index, and brain structure. So a lot of data in here. It sounds like it could be really useful, but unfortunately it's not really useful. So first of all, um, about 5.7% of this cohort were exposed to cannabis prenatally. Uh, after controlling for uh, many factors, um, including income, psychopathology of, of the parents, prenatal exposure to other substances, uh, the substance use by the child, birth weight, after controlling for a lot of things, uh, what they found was that cannabis exposure after the mom knew that she was pregnant was still statistically significant in its association with psychotic-like events, externalizing behavior, changes in intention, thought, and social problems. But exposure only prior to maternal knowledge of pregnancy uh, exposure to cannabis prior to mom knowing about the pregnancy did not impact anything uh, related to the outcomes. Now there's many problems with this data, um, but let's, uh, let's go to the conclusion. So this study suggests that prenatal cannabis exposure after maternal knowledge of pregnancy is associated with a small elevation in risk for psychopathology during childhood. Um, what were some of the limitations? Well, one, and, and I just complained about this a lot last month, I promise I'll keep it brief, uh, but this is even worse than the studies last month because parents and caregivers, uh, well, maybe it's not worse, but we'll see. They retrospectively reported uh, on cannabis use during pregnancy that occurred on average 10 years prior to the interview. Um, and so that could certainly result in biased reporting. Now, maybe they would be more likely to endorse that they were cannabis users because they weren't like at the hospital about to, uh, you know, have a baby and be threatened with uh, child protective services and, and uh, uh, neonatal intensive care, intensive care unit admission and other uh, problems like that. But um, another, another limitation is that there was uh, limited or no data on the potency, frequency, timing, or quantity of cannabis exposure. So um, we really just don't know. I mean, again, with all these studies, it would be so great if we knew how and how much and why people were using cannabis uh, to stratify these outcomes, and that would inform our patients. But what I found really interesting is that there's a very similar study that came out last year, or uh, two years ago, I guess, and, um, and these authors did not even refer to the study at all. And I'm, I, I I think I know why. Uh, so this was a similar large cohort, not quite as big, of almost 6,000 children in the Never Netherlands. And uh, they were uh, um, examined for similar problems like externalizing uh, uh, symptoms. These are aggression and rule breaking, internalizing problems, anxiety and depression, withdrawal, somatic complaints. So all of these things in this study were also associated with maternal cannabis use during pregnancy. But what's so interesting is that they were similarly and independently associated with paternal cannabis use. Meaning if dad was using cannabis, even if mom wasn't, then the offspring were more likely to have these problems. And so what this study suggests is that there's an effect due to the shared familial or genetic factors, but not to the in utero exposure. So why this paper that was really the only other one that one of the only other ones looking at the same exact outcomes, why that was t completely omitted from the recent paper is because it, it really just demonstrates uh, what that recent paper was missing, which is data on father's use of cannabis uh, to confirm or disconfirm these findings. And I, I think that that really makes that whole paper uh, a lot less credible that they left this out. Um, furthermore, uh, the statistical manipulation in there was just way beyond me. They use so many statistical techniques to massage the data. I really just don't understand uh, it. I'm not a statistician, uh, but it looked like a lot was done. And then um, as uh, uh, Michael Stewart pointed out in his email earlier, uh, it's, there's just so many factors with cannabis. I, I mean, we're kind of used to it and numb to it, but it really makes no sense to draw any conclusions from something that just lumps cannabis into one thing, cannabis use. 
uh, because we just know that there's so many ways of using cannabis and types of cannabis and constituents in cannabis and it's, um, it's, it just really doesn't um, translate to clinically relevant data, but I thought I would cover it tonight. Let's move on. We're going back to animal data. This is CBDA, and this is just really brief. Rhett, Rhett syndrome is a rare neurologic disorder that affects mostly females, and it's, uh, it's really devastating. I have had a Rhett syndrome patient. Oh, I still do have one, and um, maybe even two. And it, there's this, um, like, uh, there's kind of a normal development that happens, and then development stops, and then there's regression, and then there's the onset of these other symptoms. So it's really a devastating disorder and no good treatments for it. And we've been somewhat successful using cannabis uh, to help this uh, young girl. So this is a mouse model of Rett syndrome. And there were two studies previously that looked at CBDV, the cannabinoid CBDV in these mouse models and showed that it improved behavior and brain changes in these models. So this study said, well, CBDV worked, let's try CBDA and see if that works. And I'm just going to really um, get to the point here. A 14-day treatment with CBDA, first of all, reduced pain sensitivity in the wild type mice. So not that, so the normal mice, just treating them with CBDA reduces their sensitivity to pain. And this was um, heat-induced pain. They also found that low doses of CBDA decreased pain in the mice with the Rett syndrome. Uh, and I'll show you the, uh, the bar graph of that. And then uh, CBDA did not improve some of the other symptoms associated like, uh, like CBDV did. And it had no effect on the neurobiologic model. So based on this animal model, it looks like CBDV is a lot more effective. But I, I'm showing this tonight, not just to talk about Rett syndrome, I'm, I wanna talk about CBDA because I'm so interested in the acidic cannabinoids and we have another biphasic effect, which I think a lot of you know, I also get excited about. So um, this is the heat model. And basically if it takes them longer to lick their paw when they're standing on something that's hot, then it means that they have a less pain intensity. And this is, so, so these are, um, I believe this is the chart of normal mice. And you can see here that uh, this is the control so a very low dose of CBDA, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, uh, significantly increased the pain threshold in these normal mice. But the higher dose, two milligrams per kilogram, and the even higher, 20 milligrams per, per kilogram, did not statistically significant change the amount of pain they felt when exposed to heat. So the point here is that yes, CBDA can help with pain, uh, thermal pain certainly, other types of pain in other studies, but more is not always better. And CBDA can be extremely potent. So tiny doses work. And uh, it, you know, I think a lot of you um, know that in uh, the material that we've uh, kind of included in our hemp products, one of which is a CBDA dominant formula, uh, we are recommending that people start at just five milligrams and, and see what that does for them. And I, you know, I, I'm wondering sometimes if just starting at one milligram uh, would be a better idea because there's something magic that happens in this ultra low dose range. And if we want to take the time to thoroughly explore it, you know, I, th I think that's one of the problems with these super broad dosing ranges is you can tell someone, well, I'm not sure if you're going to respond at one milligram or a hundred milligrams and both are perfectly safe, but it's going to take you two years to really carefully explore all the doses in between. That just doesn't work uh, practically. So we have to pick uh, a starting dose and then a titration frequency and amount that'll kind of be compatible uh, with the person's timeline and the urgency of their goals. Uh, but the real point here is that CBDA can help with pain, uh, at least in animal models, and I've seen it in humans as well, but more is not always better. More might be less. Same exact thing could be said about THC. Okay, efficacy of combined therapy with fish oil phytocannabin and phytocannabinoids in a mouse model of colitis or intestinal inflammation. So uh, this paper tested, or, the, or this experiment tested the anti-inflammatory effects of fish oil in combination with both CBD and CBG in a model that's of uh, colitis, which is inflammation in the large intestine. And so what they did was they gave this intracolonic administration of DNBS, which causes the inflammation. They gave the fish oil at the same time as the DNBS, 75 milligrams uh, per day, once per day over four days. And then they gave the cannabinoids, uh, not on day one, but on day 
uh, two, three, and four, and a wide range of doses, look, from 0.3 up to 60. So you can tell that the preclinical researchers are getting used to this, and, and they didn't used to be, but they're realizing now, wow, we, you know, we better do uh, at least a 100 or 200 fold dosing range. Really, they should probably be doing a 1,000 or 2,000 fold dosing range if they could, uh, because cannabinoids are just that strange. And so what they found here, uh, this is really some really interesting synergy results. So uh, kind of the major measure I'm showing here of the inflammation is the colon weight uh, divided by the colon length. And this is the control group. So then when they gave the uh, inflammatory compound, DNBS, you can see the weight to length ratio went way up. And so that weight is just inflamed tissue. And, uh, and so you can uh, see the, the inflamed tissue here. Now, uh, look what happened when they added CBG. Not much at 0.31 and 3, nothing statistically significant there. 10 milligrams per kilogram of CBG did reduce inflammation, but 30 and 60 milligrams, even though it did reduce inflammation, not quite as much as 10. So in this model, again, we have this tricky little sweet spot here at 10 milligrams per kilogram. What about CBD? Not really anything here. While it looks like there's a little variation, nothing was statistically significant. So none of the doses of CBD tested in this model of inflammation impacted, uh, impacted the animals. Now, what happens when we do some other combinations? This is pretty cool. So fish oil plus CBG in this model. And what you can basically see if you just glance at it is that when, when taken with fish oil, the best dose of CBG went from 10 down to one milligram per kilogram. So the fish oil essentially made the CBG 10 times more potent in this model of colon inflammation. Uh, the 30 um, milligrams per kilogram was just barely statistically significant, but really uh, 30 and 10 weren't. So there's, a, again, administered with fish oil, there's a sweet spot, but the sweet spot is one-tenth of the sweet spot without the fish oil. Wow, this is getting complex. And then if we look at CBD, uh, big change here. So now when administered with fish oil, instead of doing nothing at all for this model, almost all of the doses of CBD affected this model. CBD had this combined effect with fish oil that made it effective at just about any dose. It's just amazing. And, and what's fish oil? Omega-3 fatty acids, they have anti-inflammatory properties. They also affect our endocannabinoid levels. And a lot of people are taking them or getting them in the diet. And uh, clearly this can impact the anti-inflammatory properties of CBD and CBG. So, and just you know, a little tie-in to our earlier conversation, what about that immunotherapy paper? What if those people were or weren't taking fish oil or other anti or pro-inflammatory compounds? It's, it's kind of too small of a cohort to really tease all that stuff out. But as you can see here, that could have made a big difference. Now, what about combining all of them together? Well, this is pretty cool. So um, uh, let's, let's take a look over here first. This is the control. This is the inflammatory compound. This would be fish oil plus CBG at the very low dose, which did nothing. Fish oil plus CBD at the very low dose, which did nothing. Combine them all together at the very low dose, and it does have a statistically significant difference. So now we have fish oil plus CBD plus CBG makes an even lower, lower dose effective when you do all three of them. And, uh, and the same thing here on just a different measure of inflammation. And it's a little more profound using this MPO uh, measurement. So uh, synergistic effects in cannabis. We know this, uh, this isn't new, but it's always really interesting to take a look at it. So fish oil and CBD on their own did not affect the colitis. Fish oil pretreatment increased the anti-inflammatory effects of CBG, and it made oral CBD effective. The highest dose of CBD uh, did not affect the endocannabinoid levels, which is a little uh, unexpected, uh, because often we think that that's one way that CBD is working by uh, decreasing the reuptake and breakdown of anandamide, uh, but maybe not at this dose in rodents. Fish oil did significantly increase the levels of 2-AG, an endocannabinoid, and PEA, which is an endocannabinoid-like lipid molecule, uh, palmitol ethanolamide, uh, which is really something interesting that we'll probably talk about at some point on the webinar. And uh, these differences were absent in uh, CBD plus fish oil. So Again, it, this last one is just a great kicker. So the fish oil changes the endocannabinoid levels 
unless you give it with CBD, then it did not change the endocannabinoid levels. I hope, uh, I, I hope this is coming across. I, I know there's a lot of nuances in tonight's webinar, but um, the take home point is, wow, there are, uh, there's just so much we don't know and all sorts of interesting dose response effects and combination effects. Okay, I'm gonna keep it a little simple now. Uh, th this kind of comes back to where we started, um, the gratitude and the acknowledgement of what cannabis can do for our species and um, something that's just so badly needed, in, in my opinion, in our species right now is a sense of unity and cooperation and, um, and uh, co continuity, oneness. And, and to me, that's, uh, those are qualities of spiritual experiences, spiritual uh, existence. And so uh, this paper does a really nice job of kind of summarizing some of the literature on the long history of spiritual cannabis use from ancient Israel and India and more recent. Um, and then it, it comments that as cannabis use became normalized in Western societies in the 70s and 80s, it seems to have lost much of its spiritual connotations and became just one more intoxicant alongside others. Uh, the, the paper comments that the proportion of daily or near daily cannabis users in the United States doubled during the years 2002 to 2017. So what this means is among all the cannabis users, which was kind of the same during that time period, the amount that we're using it daily or near daily doubled. So people are using it more frequently. And the writers emphasize that the spiritual potential of cannabis uh, uh, not, not just the author of this article, but he cites many other authors who emphasize that the spiritual potential of cannabis, uh, that they often warn against overuse. Um, and that sentence did not come out right, but basically overuse can diminish the spiritual potential. So uh, this was a, first an interview study, which was qualitative, meaning getting like, what are, what are people saying? Uh, with 29 current or past users of entheogenic drugs. And they used that data to build a survey that they then administered to 265 people. And uh, none of these are, are groundbreaking findings, but I think it just brings our attention to the spiritual side of cannabis. So uh, among the spiritual users, there was a signal that the frequent use was found to diminish their cannabis experiences and that consciously limiting the usage frequency in order to maintain the spiritual value of their cannabis practice was commonly reported. And on average, uh, those that endorsed using it spiritually talked about using it once a week to a few times per year. Uh, um, respondents often reported that having meditative or introspective cannabis sessions, oh, the, the spiritual users often reported having these meditative or introspective sessions, while the survey respondents that did not endorse using it spiritually, did not report introspection. So there was some association between using cannabis to go within and a spiritual use of cannabis. And, and that's probably distinct from using cannabis to say, uh, watch a movie or do the dishes, which you know I'm, I don't mean to put any judgment on those. You guys can use cannabis to watch a movie and do the dishes, that can, that can be helpful. Um, but, um, but maybe not spiritual may be spiritual though, doing the dishes with cannabis could be. Uh, so the survey showed clear correlations between having a spiritual motivation for cannabis use and ending up with a spiritual type cannabis experience. Now this is well known with, with all the psychedelics essentially that are what they call set and setting, meaning our mindset that we bring to this. So if our intention is to have an introspective experience or to have a spiritual experience, we're gonna be more likely to have that. And, if, and, uh, and we're not going to be likely to have that if, if that's not our intention. And so the conclusion was that the user's approach to cannabis in terms of motivation and usage pattern has a considerable impact upon their experiences. And the big signals were that those using it for spiritual purposes and achieving spiritual purposes, number one, that was their intention. And number two, they generally recognized that less is more and using it less often was more helpful uh, when, uh, to make it so that their cannabis was a spiritual experience. And I am closing up and let's, let's talk. Wow, I went for a whole hour tonight. Thank you all for hanging with me. I guess that was a lot of data, but there's just so many studies I can't pass them up and still there's some from the last couple of months that I wanna cover. Maybe the literature will give me a break and I can catch up next month, but probably not. 
So um, thank you all for hanging around. I, I have not been uh, reading the chat, but I bet there's a lot of questions. And I would just start with if anybody has questions specifically related to the studies uh, that we just covered. And if anyone wants to ask that live, uh, just make that comment in the chat and Simone can unmute you and we can have a live question. And, and th these could be questions or, or if there's uh, short and relevant comments, I'm just happy to have your comments as well about anything that we discussed so far tonight. And then while we're waiting for you to volunteer your questions or comments, I'm going to uh, switch over to the previously submitted questions and I'll field the first one from Kelly Warshall. She says, hello, I have a patient who gets thrush every time he vapes cannabis, but it's his preferred delivery method and is on medical cannabis. Uh, he has no history of diabetes, antibiotic or steroid use. He said it happens every time he vapes. Besides having him rinse his mouth out with water after vaping, do you have any suggestions as to why this is happening and what to do. So thrush is a yeast infection. It's a candida infection of the mouth and throat. And um, it's interesting, the relationship of, uh, between cannabis and yeast, I have not, um, I don't think I've discussed that previously on the webinar. So uh, there is a little bit of animal data that shows that cannabis, in, at least in, in these mouse models, can promote candida infections can um, make it worse or make it harder for the animal to recover. And that, I, when I say cannabis, I, I believe uh, that that's specifically THC. Uh, why would it do that? Probably for the same reason it was getting in the way of the cancer immunotherapy, because while cannabis is not a general immunosuppressant, it's an immunomodulator. It increases certain aspects of the immune system. It decreases certain aspects of the immune system. And uh, because of that, there's gonna be an increased ability to fight against certain infections and certain other things and a, and a decreased ability. And it seems like cannabis and, and candida might not be a good combination at certain doses in some people. Now, this is just one case. I've treated lots and lots of patients with cannabis and I, I would not say in general that it promotes candida infections, but in someone that has, uh, a, tr has a lot of trouble with candida and clearing candida, they may wanna back off on the cannabis and see if that's helpful or not helpful. Okay, do we have a live? Yeah, okay, go for it. Melissa, um, go ahead. Melissa, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Great. Hi. How are you? Oh, you know I love this. I'm doing great. <laughs> it's been such a long day, um, and I'm, and it, this just gets me going. When you know, when we're inspired, we feel differently, right? And, and we think yeah. more clearly, and and uh, and we can perform even on low sleep and after a long day in the clinic. How, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. So my my question is. Um, I'm still taking Herceptin Progetta. So for those of you on here, I had stage four breast cancer and I did, I did, um, um, <laughs> chemo, I did chemotherapy for 12 weeks and Herceptin Progetta and a host of other all, of things, therapy and alternative treatments, that sort of thing. Um, and so I'm off now and I haven't, I haven't had no sign of cancer since then with testing and all that. So, but tonight this really, kind of hit me because I think the Herceptin Progetta is a, um, a, is immunotherapy, I'm pretty sure. So uh, not, not like this. No, the Herceptin Progetta is, um, based on my understanding, it's more acting on the, uh, the HER2 receptors and, right. and, and blocking this mechanism of um, a kind of pro-malignant changes in the cell. So, okay. so more working directly on the cancer cell, not indirectly via the immune system. But, um, but probably your question is still very relevant. So I, those aren't the same class of drugs, but please continue your question. So I think that was it. I wasn't quite sure. In my head, I, 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 it's been called immunotherapy, but it, I know it doesn't act on the immune system. So I just needed that clarification. So thank you for that. Um, and I have, I have one other question. That's well, let's, let, me, um, let me finish what I thought might have been your first question. Sure. And, and maybe it was. So, and this, this is just a really common question. Um, if cannabis can have effects on the immune system that can 
in some cases block the immune system's ability to fight cancer. What might cannabis be doing in your situation for what we call secondary prevention, right? We want, we want to prevent the recurrence of cancer. Might cannabis be limiting your immune system's ability to prevent cancer recurrence? And, and so that, that yes. you know, I think that that's a very important question that I get asked all the time. Uh, and we still don't know the answer for that, but I think the thing that would make it much easier for us to answer that is an understanding of whether or not your specific tumor cells uh, had cannabinoid receptors on them or associated receptors in the cannabinoid world and the cannabinoid system. So basically your uh, pathologist was able to tell you Oh, look, your, your cancer was progesterone positive or negative, estrogen positive yeah. or negative, HER2 positive or negative. We need them to say CB1 positive or negative, maybe TRIP-V1 positive or negative. And, and we covered this all um, in another study from Deddy Mieri uh, last year, uh, because it, it looks like from a little bit of animal data that in cancers that lack any target for the cannabinoids, basically, if they don't have the CB1 receptor on the cancer cells, that the effect of cannabis might be pro-neoplastic. It might, it might work against the immune system, but fail to work against the cancer and throw off that balance. It's theoretical. We don't know which cancers have CB1 and, and, and so forth. I think most of them do. Uh, it's something that I, I would really love uh, to figure out. We, we actually had a project here in Maine uh, with a pathologist where we were developing antibody tests uh, to look at these receptors on cancers, and, and we were trying to make a commercial test. And what we found out was uh, that the tools available in research science for determining whether a specific tumor has or does not have CB1 and CB, especially CB2 receptors, it, it's a terrible tool. We couldn't get a clear answer. Maybe we should have just ran with CB1 uh, because that would have been more important anyways. Uh, but go ahead, Melissa, what's your second question? Um, I don't know. I'm still, you, I, my, my, my head is still in, in your answer to the first question. Um, so I guess we're just, we're waiting, we're waiting to see if, I, I, basically there are no real answers. Uh, yeah, we, there's no real answers. And so what do we do with that? We, we surf the unknowns, okay? And there's a lot of ways of doing that. You know, in my opinion, uh, our bodies give us signs about uh, what we're doing with cannabis and how we're responding to it. And in the sure. absence of any uh, kind of quantitative measurement that we might get from a lab or anywhere else, I think that there's a certain um, regimen of cannabis for anyone that promotes overall health. And when a person is engaging in that, they're going to be sleeping, they're going to be balanced, they're going to have uh, an autonomic uh, nervous system that's uh, in balance and, and fully functional. Uh, so many other things that indirectly and directly impact the chance of cancer recurrence. Yeah. Like it's for not example, a, it, it go goes also, I'm sorry, it also goes back to your last, your last slide and that was on the, um, the, the being ethogen, I've never heard of this, but the spirituality. For yeah. some people like who, do, who did it and it was a spiritual experience, it cleared a lot of blockages and it helped in the healing on that level. And that's something that can't be measured in a lab, you know, it and can't I, be, but is, it can be measured in people. So if you look yeah. at people that have had spontaneous remissions of cancer, there's a mm -hmm. high percentage of them that have had some kind of a spiritual awakening, yeah. right? We, we know there's an association there and, right. uh, and same with all these other factors. So, yeah, I mean, thank you for saying that uh, people are holistic. We're not these, discrete cause and effect models. And the, the big problem in medicine right now is that we've over relied on cause and effect and these, these little narrow minded perspectives of something that's an incredibly beautiful, huge system that, that we need to zoom out and, and get the big picture of. So yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. And I guess the one thing I didn't say that I wanna point out is, while the cannabinoids can modulate the immune system and in some cases do so in a way that would not benefit someone with cancer, the cannabinoids can do so many things that do benefit people with cancer, including directly targeting the cancer cells and helping them die and uh, helping them stop growing and, and preventing them from moving across tissue boundaries into other parts of the body. So, um, and, I, and the other thing that I wanted to point out is if you look at the literature, what are the factors uh, specifically for breast cancer that are related to preventing recurrence, 
sleep and exercise are probably the two highest on the list, mm -hmm. right? And, and, so, and so think of those as just holistic things that promote all sorts of other aspects of health, right? That, so this is just really complex. It is. Thank you, Melissa, for bringing that up. That was great. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the spreadsheet and um, do one more previously submitted and then we'll take a live. So this next one is from Bill Holt. Um, can you elaborate on how and why utilizing healer drops, especially CBDA, is good both sublingually and topically in general? But in my case, it is great in both instances for my own rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. So why is CBDA good for rheumatoid and psoriatic and why, why is it good topically? And why is it good internally? And I think we covered some of that. Um, CBDA is an anti-inflammatory and it works a lot like CBD, but it seems to be quite potent. And then CBDA is also a little different in terms of its ability to dissolve in water versus oil. Uh, and so um, it probably gets distributed in the tissues in a way that was uh, different than CBD. If you, I, I think he was comparing that to CBD. So uh, thank you for that question. Do we have a live one? Uh, yes, Stanley has a question. Go ahead, Stanley. Hi, yes, uh, sorry, I was just uh, unmuting. Um, I have a question in reference to uh, using curcumin as extract. I use it for carpal tunnel and it, it really helps, but I was wondering if there's any studies um, that have been done on the interaction uh, with curcumin extracts and uh, CB for example, CBD dominant cannabis or just cannabis in general? Ah, racking my brain now. I have a memory of something, but I, I think what I'm remembering is that in two different studies, curcumin has been shown to alter the endocannabinoid system. In one case in the brain and in another case in the liver in ways that would seem beneficial. So I, I think that curcumin does interact with our endocannabinoid system and that's probably one of its mechanisms because it has many uh, of, of how it works. Um, but I don't know if there's any data on using it, like the study tonight with the fish oil and the CB, you know, that would be a perfect uh, thing to try with curcumin. You know, that same, that same model would be interesting. But, and um, it would fill in the blank because there's just so many great herbs that bring us these safe anti-inflammatory effects. But uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. And uh, congrats on success with your carpal tunnel. Has cannabis done anything for carpal tunnel? Um, to be honest, I've been having difficulties with it. I took a RSO extract uh, like several months ago and I got super sick from it. I don't, I've, I thought it was a reputable site. They had a certificate of analysis, but I don't know if they had the full lab test. And so ever since then, I've been getting kind of headaches, even taking like drops. So I was wondering, I don't know if I can maybe talk to you later through a consultation about that, but it's just the that's, most bizarre thing. Yeah, to be honest. that's yeah. very interesting. And, and you broke up a little bit there, but I, I didn't get the dosage, but my understanding is you did this uh, really high potency concentrate of cannabis. And ever since that you had an adverse reaction to that, you've been sensitized in a way that makes it hard for you to tolerate even lower doses of, is it THC? Um, well, I, initially I was using um, CBD dominant hemp flower. However, some of the strains did have one or 2% THC. I mean, that's low, but you know, it's, it's still there. Uh, I would, I noticed I would notice kind of like a head, kind of headache almost. And then um, I moved on to, to CBD oil and a similar result with a very little amount. I haven't tried any in, in several weeks, but it's, it's bizarre for sure. It's not unheard of. Thank you for sharing that. So I have seen this in, in patients. I'm working with one right now who had a psychotic-like experience uh, when using high doses of RSO. He was using it for an inflammatory condition. And now he really has no ability to tolerate uh, THC. Um, and, and so my, uh, and, and I've had a few cases like this in the past, maybe one that I've successfully treated with homeopathic cannabis. And, and so that's, that's a really interesting way of going about this. Homeopathic cannabis would be extraordinarily dilute uh, preparation of cannabis that really doesn't have any of the molecules of THC in it, but just the energetic frequency of it. And by exposing one of that frequency, it could correct that imbalance. 
I, you know, I would try it under the guidance of a, a homeopath. I see uh, Becca asked, where do you get it? I've ordered mine from a homeopathic company in Germany, but I do see, um, did I see? Uh, well, some other people may be able to answer that in the chat. Uh, but um, yeah, I think Pam is on. Pam, if you're on and you uh, and you know anything about homeopathic ca cannabis, or if you offer that at your pharmacy, uh, we'd be interested to hear that. And you know, I, I believe that I haven't ever read this, but based on the timing in the literature, I think that this whole indica versus sativa uh, kind of dichotomy actually came out of homeopathy because there's two. Uh, you know, kind of really old homeopathic remedies, one that's called cannabis indica and one that's called cannabis sativa, and they have, they have different properties. Okay, Thank thanks, Stanley. Let me go back to uh, another question that I think was really um, similar, uh, or maybe not. So, so this is uh, from Kathy uh, Georgie. I have ovarian cancer and I've tried the Rick Simpson oil. Is this the best cannabis for a systemic cancer? If not, what is an appropriate one and the dosage I should take? So, um, you know, I just bring that up as an example of a really complex question that cannot be oversimplified. But what I've uh, done my best of in the uh, healer training curriculum is uh, kind of presenting the, uh, the simple but um, multifaceted or pragmatic approach to figuring out how to treat someone with cancer uh, using cannabis. And it, it really starts with the person's goals, their prognosis and their understanding of the prognosis, the other uh, treatments that they're doing. And then uh, there's often a, a phase one trial, which is low to moderate dose cannabis to help improve lifestyle parameters like sleep and happiness and quality of life, and maybe to um, have somewhat of an anti-cancer effect because the low and moderate doses have been shown to do that even in people, maybe to have a synergistic effect with the conventional treatments, uh, maybe to mitigate the adverse effects of conventional treatments and to help people tolerate them and stay in treatment and complete their treatments. Uh, and then if there's not a, um, an acceptable level of response and the cancer is progressing and people want to kind of switch gears and go into a much more aggressive cannabis plan, that, that's what we would do. And, um, and we would, th there's a number of qualities of what type of uh, preparation we would choose. And really, um, again, we're being informed by the unknowns. So as many different varieties of cannabis as possible, extracted in a way that preserves as many of these trace constituents without uh, changing them. Uh, and uh, at, at a very high doses uh, administered in a, in a routine that enhances but does not detract from quality of life. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell, uh, but we do get into a deeper, uh, deeper discussion in the curriculum. Okay, do we have any, uh, should we keep going back and forth, live spreadsheet, live spreadsheet, do we have more live? So we don't have anyone that would like to speak, but I put in some live questions that uh, people had asked in the chat um, on the second tab on the spreadsheet. Thank you for reminding me about the second tab. Okay, um, first one is from Jeff Tattis. I would like to ask you a question about Epstein-Barr syndrome. A patient of mine in Michigan has a relative in Illinois who's suffering from Epstein-Barr, having found success with regular pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I mean, it's um, Epstein-Barr is a, a viral syndrome. It causes um, mononucleosis, and, um, and for some people, it can be kind of a, a long-term, a chronic contributor uh, to symptoms, and uh, there's not a lot that can be done about it. Some of the antiviral medications help some patients. I, I don't have a lot of experience treating it, but um, the, the answer is also included in the curriculum, which is we don't treat the diagnosis, we treat the person. And so treating a person with Epstein-Barr might look very similar to treating a person with multiple sclerosis or treating a person with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or uh, Lyme disease or a number of other things. What do we do? We use cannabis to help them uh, address their symptoms and to get, uh, get some restorative sleep and to uh, uh, you know, turn on their, uh, uh, improve their GI function if it's not working well, enhance uh, elimination or uh, ability to consume good nutrition. Uh, we use cannabis to help them uh, you know, laugh and play and uh, decrease the stress in their life and, and change their response to the stressors in their life and uh, make that spiritual connection that Melissa brought up and that we talked about earlier. So it's, it's treat the patient and not the diagnosis. 
Let's do another one. I am trying to be able to use your CBD for my mom who has dementia and anxiety. The nursing home in Pennsylvania says they will not allow it. Any suggestions to convince them? A doctor's order might work. Um, I do that here. So uh, I can not get the federally funded uh, nursing homes to administer herbal cannabis, but if we kind of say that CBD is a nutritional supplement, which is kind of a great thing to say, it it, it certainly is uh, a nutritional supplement and it's sold and used as a nutritional supplement, but the federal government doesn't exactly consider it that at the moment. Uh, maybe they'll change on that one. But nevertheless, the nur from, for the nursing home's purposes, usually a doctor's order to use a nutritional supplement is, is enough. Uh, don't expect them to do it with uh, THC containing uh, cannabis, you know, above 0.3%. Now, what else can I say about this? There, um, there is dronabinol, which is synthetic THC. It's FDA approved. That could certainly be ordered by the doctor and administered there. there there's uh, FDA approved CBD called Epidiolex, which is extremely expensive. It's not going to work. And, um, I, you know, again, Pam, if you want to comment on this, if you know anything about it, but there was compounded CBD available for a very short time. CBD isolate in the compounding pharmacies, and now it's gone. Uh, so it, it could have been an FDA approved uh, CBD made by a compounding pharmacist into capsules or something else and administered, but I believe that that, is, um, that has been removed from the compounders, unfortunately. All right, I'm gonna go back. I'm just bouncing around questions and we'll keep going for a little longer, but I love the live one, so let me know when you have a live question. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, Simone, you got one? Yeah, we have uh, David wanted to. Um, go ahead, David. Hi, <clears throat> great presentation. I, uh, I own a small CBD company. Every, every time we, someone asks about um, how to use CBD, I always direct them to your site. My dad's tuning in. He has a rare autoimmune disease called amyloidosis, if I'm saying it correctly. And he's found that CBDA, and he loves using the raw forms. We've learned a lot from you. One of the things that he's struggled with a lot, I don't know if you've seen it, Doc, is swelling in the tongue. Do you, are you familiar with any studies that? Be able to treat the inflammation in his tongue specifically? <sighs> no studies and not much clinical experience, to be honest with you, but you know, when I think about, I don't know, I would, I would have to do a little research on that. I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for you. I mean, you know, with, with cannabis and, and its anti-inflammatory properties, I'm sure you've tried a few different things, but it sounds like uh, my guess is you haven't been uh, successful yet. And the tongue swelling is kind of the thing that's uh, failing to respond. That's the biggest pain, but it's, it's, it's helped for everything else. Because if you're familiar with amyloidosis, it's just, yeah, a lot of different forms of inflammation and pain. But in general, he likes taking it, yeah, in raw forms and smoothies, just putting the whole flour, blending it up in a smoothie, and it helps, but it's that swelling in the tongue that's been the biggest, biggest pain. Don't have a lot for you. Uh, cannabis tea with THCA in it, did he swish any of that around? No, that's a good idea, though. So, um, and what's the sensation on the tongue? Pain or itching or tingling, or what's, it, what's he got there? Just extreme inflammation. I don't know that there's any pain per se but it just makes it really hard he's having to mash up the food and he's a you know retired dentist who loves to communicate and so oh, it's a, wow. it's a pain he's used to talking to all six of my brothers and i and it's it's tough for him he can't tell all of his jokes because his tongue is, is swollen yeah i don't know I, I wish i had a better answer for you thank you for asking see i, I th there's a lot we have left to learn and it's the second time amyloidosis has come up to me this week, so I, I think I need to dig in. I know there's these protein dep deposits and there's genetic components to it, but it, it's a condition that I don't know that I've worked with clinically. Well, I love what you're doing, and thank you so much for your presentation tonight. You're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Okay. I'm going back to the spreadsheet. Let Simone know if you have um, another question you'd like to ask uh, out loud. So um, what about breast, this is from Lee Ann. What about breast cancer? I've had people tell me estrogen positive breast cancer patients get worse with cannabis. 
I don't believe that and haven't seen that, but for some reason, it seems people think this is true. Yes, people think this is true. And this was covered in Healer webinar, maybe I could tell you, well, I, I, it was covered about a year ago. We could, we could probably get you the specific uh, month and, and year. But basically there was one mouse study that used breast cancer cells that lacked the CB1 receptor. And in that study, administering THC to those rodents suppressed the immune system, but did not kill the cancer. So it's basically what, what we were talking about before. Uh, and it's one of the only studies where we've ever seen cannabis make cancer worse in animals, or THC make cancer worse in animals. And it was because those cancer cells were not sensitive to the THC. Now, in that study, there were two cell lines that lacked the CB1 receptor. One was estrogen positive, estrogen receptor positive. The other one, I believe, was triple negative, but don't quote me on that. I'd have to uh, verify. And both of them got worse. But somehow on the internet, just the estrogen positive one was focused on. Everybody started saying THC makes estrogen positive breast cancer worse. And there you have it. It's, it's just a, a rumor on the internet. It is absolutely not true. I've seen many women with estrogen sensitive breast cancers do very well with cannabis. Uh, again, it would be great when we were testing for that estrogen receptor if we could have also tested for the CB1 receptor. And hopefully that'll happen sometime. Um, Justin, we have a live question from Dr. Lani. Okay. Hello there, Dustin. Pleasure hey, to see you again. You Good to see you too. I love that you guys, thank you, thank you. I love that you guys are doing a presentation about your products. You finally got them out. The CBDA uh, is something I've been excited about. Um, I, I remember when I was training with you, you taught us about the teas. So I've been teaching my clients how to use hemp flour to make CBDA um, to use that. And I've been actually getting a lot of families using it with their children with autism and ADHD and starting to get some good results with that. I'm wondering if you have any uh, research that you've come across that specifically talks about CBDA in those populations. CBDA in those populations. Uh -oh, I, think I lost you. You froze. Oh, I, I froze. I'm still here. I, maybe, hopefully everyone can still see me and hear me. Okay. So I don't know of any human okay, data. There we on, go. I, I don't know of any human data on CBDA and the autistic spectrum uh, population. I don't think that, that that's been done yet. I might be wrong about that, but I, I don't remember it. But, you know, th there is a lot of data on CBD. And um, a lot of the mechanisms of action, potential mechanisms of action of how CBD helps are shared by CBDA, but often it seems like in, in the animal studies that the CBDA is stronger and uh, it gets absorbed better. And so a cup of tea uh, that might just do the trick. And I think if you have access to hemp flowers, uh, there's no reason uh, for most people not to just pop one in your morning cup of green tea or coffee or whatever else it is and let some CBDA dissolve in your tea as well. It's, uh, it's not impairing and it's anti-inflammatory and a lot of people really like the way it feels. Okay. I was, I was wondering if there's any synergistic effect between CBDA and CBD to suggest the use concurrently. You know, I, I don't know. Um, probably, I, I don't think I've seen that studied might have been. You can see I'm having a little trouble remembering every single study that we've covered. Thank goodness we have all of these rec uh, recorded. There, there has absolutely been um, an animal model that showed uh, a really strong um, synergistic effect of THC with CBDA. And uh, the doses that were effective when you, when you use those two agents together are yeah, extremely low. Yeah, so, but probably, probably um, you know, what's the real difference? Well, one of the main differences between CBDA and CBD has to do with the way in which they affect the endocannabinoid system. So while CBDA is mimicking so mm -hmm. much of what CBD is doing, it's not really, it doesn't look like it's modulating CB1 receptor activity and it doesn't look like it's preventing the reuptake and breakdown of our endocannabinoid anandamide. So because of that, uh, people may want that endocannabinoid modulating effect while still getting some CBDA. And that's why even in our CBD product, we include some CBDA because we think it makes the product stronger. 
Well, thanks, Lonnie. I'm glad to see you and keep up the good work. Let's take a peek at um, another previously submitted question because I know the people that do that early uh, really hope their questions get answered. So um, is there a cannabis formula from Susan Johnson? Is there a cannabis formula that might be effective to treat my husband's essential tremor of the hand and the head? I'm taking CBD THCA one to one. That's an interesting one. Uh, formula for general wellness, right? So those are good, two good, um, you know, non non impairing cannabinoids. Would this be effective for that purpose? So that is not where I would start. Uh, when it comes to essential tremor, I've absolutely seen some cases respond very well to cannabis. Most of the time, when I see that, it's uh, short duration effects from inhaled cannabis. And I, I often have people with essential tremor, and they'll start with like an oral one to one. Uh, CBD to THC, and they'll come back and say it might be a little bit better. And, um, you know, I'm definitely feeling better and sleeping better, but I'm still, my tremor hasn't really changed that much. Um, and, and by the way, I see uh, Laurel Shepard, uh, a nurse practitioner that I work with now. She popped into my front page. Hi, Laurel. If you want to uh, jump in uh, and make any comments on your experience with essential tremor. So, Laurel and I have been working together for uh, about 10 years, more than 10 years, and, um, and she sees a lot of patients in my clinic, and I'm, I'm happy to hear your comments too. But I think uh, it's fine to start off with oral. Probably THC is going to be the, the most likely effective when taken orally, but when it really comes down to it, I think it's going to be the inhaled that's most likely uh, going to be effective, if effective at all. And um, uh, Simone, uh, would you mind, uh, Laurel, do you want us to unmute you? You got anything to add about essential tremor? If you, uh, Simone, would you unmute yeah. Laurel? Okay, hey, Laurel. I'm here. Hey there, Dusty. Um, yeah, I've had similar with you in terms of for essential tremor, not seeing long lasting effects um, from cannabis. They get very excited when they first start using it and then it quickly diminishes the effect wise. Um, Sadly, but yeah, I've been seeing the same as you have. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for chiming in there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see what else we've got. Um, risk of prescribing for people with hypertension and or cardiac disorders and for people with bipolar. So all of that is covered in the healer curriculum, but just to summarize really quickly, uh, both CBD and THC can decrease blood pressure, but not a lot, and it'll do it more so uh, in people that have higher blood pressures, it doesn't really affect normal blood pressure very much. But if someone's got a severe cardiac condition that can't deal with increased demand, meaning uh, if they try to get their heart rate up, they're getting chest pain or they can't you know, breathe or whatever that is, uh, be really, really careful with cannabis and avoid inhaled cannabis because inhaled cannabis can um, not only make the blood pressure go down a little bit, it can make the heart rate go up. Oral cannabis can do this in an overdose setting, but at like uh, precision doses uh, that are titrated carefully, uh, it, it really doesn't do that. So, uh, you know, we do have people with severe cardiac disease that can very carefully take cannabis orally, but we don't do inhaled. Okay, oh, and then bipolar disorder. So uh, bipolar disorder, uh, cannabis can help a lot. You know, I think one of the most important things in bipolar is uh, regular sleep rhythm and restorative sleep. And of course, if cannabis is used to promote that, it can be helpful. Uh, you know, just in general, the big uh, kind of epidemiologic data shows that, it shows these two things that seem paradoxical. One is that people with bipolar who use cannabis have better neurocognitive function than those who do not. But then also people with bipolar who use cannabis have more manic episodes than those who do not. And I think that absolutely has everything to do with their use pattern. Uh, because we could easily use the wrong type of cannabis and smoke it all night and stay up and do something super creative and have a great time with it. But that is not going to be healthy for someone with bipolar. Um, you know, but they could also take the right type of cannabis to get regular sleep and uh, maybe the right type to um, stay focused and relieve their depression during the day and stay engaged and inspired in life. And that, that's gonna make all the difference. And you know, since it's one of our themes tonight um, and it's that spiritual piece as well, if, if it helps them cultivate that, then I think they're gonna uh, do better with their condition. Okay, so we often end around now. I'll go for another um, five or 10 minutes. And uh, again, if there's any live questions, jump in, uh, but let me go back to um, these uh, spreadsheets here. 
so um oh oh you got one simone okay let's do it hi dustin can you hear me yes holly hi hi how are you you, you kind of touched on this two questions ago but i'm working with a new client she's about 75 She's got lots of medical problems, but she was hospitalized recently for heart palpitations. And she told me that her grandson brought her a joint, which he had tried to smoke, uh, which I was unhappy about. I In the hospital? Had, yeah, <laughs> not at the hospital, but before. She does have uh, out of control blood pressure, depression, insomnia. She's on a bunch of, of blood pressure medications that are not fully regulated yet. Uh, but she says that with, with uh, aspirin, she gets nosebleeds. So, you know, of course, I'm thinking no THC at all for her. But uh, is there some other formulation she might take that would help with some of her other symptoms? Yeah, I mean, if she were my patient, I, I'd, I'd want to understand, like, what type of arrhythmia it is and how serious it is. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's a, a strict contraindication to THC. I would just say it means use THC very carefully orally and, and start at a dose that's subtherapeutic, like one milligram is probably going to do nothing to her. Hang out there for a few days. You know, I, what I would do is hang out there for a few days and then see what two milligrams or maybe one, even one and a half if I want to be extra careful. Because it's likely that with that route of delivery, the oral route, that she could get some of these benefits without any of the adverse cardiovascular effects, even of THC. And then when you combine CBD and THC, it makes the cardiovascular effects of THC even less likely. And that has been shown uh, in people that the CBD can mitigate these uh, kind of uh, cardiac adverse effects. So does that help? Yes, I'm, I was worried about the anticoagulant effects too. I'm wondering if uh, the raw products have less anticoagulant effects Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest concern with uh, anticoagulant effects would be a drug interaction with Coumadin or Warfarin if she was taking that, which mm -hmm. is being used less and less often now. Um, and so, uh, they, you know, usually people, when they take Coumadin or Warfarin, they have to kind of eat the same amount of vitamin K in their diet. Uh, if, they, if they eat a lot one day and not the, not the next day, it can counteract the effects of that medication. Cannabis is kind of similar where um, you would want to be on a stable dose of cannabis, and if you were changing the dose of cannabis while taking warfarin, you would want to get your blood checked to make sure the dose of warfarin didn't need to be decreased, essentially, because cannabis can slow the breakdown of that drug. Okay. But in general, cannabis does not uh, prevent clotting or, or cause bleeding, and I think, um, you know, so many, there's just so many things about chronic stress that are pro-thrombotic, th thrombotic, uh, meaning like can produce clots or make clotting worse that, uh, you know, I, I think anyone with heart disease, getting them smiling and sleeping and uh, feeling centered and feeling, you know, uh, open to love and connection, I, I think is really important. Hey, yeah, I was concerned about her nosebleeds and it wasn't clear to me whether her nosebleeds were caused by the hypertension or something else was going on with her. Yeah. So I, I just Feel like I need more information. I'm not sure she's a great historian, so uh, I, I feel like I have to be very careful with her. Sounds like a good case for caution. Thank you. I, th I think that's a great example for, for the rest of the viewers to, you know, just kind of hear how we go about thinking about these sensitive cases. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. 838. We haven't answered everything, but we've gotten close. It's interesting. Someone asked me, uh, Dermot uh, Kavana asked me a question about immunotherapy. I'm pretty sure we answered that. Um, uh, you know, I, but the question was specifically to CBD, and the answer is we have no clue because that, the, the, that Israeli data doesn't tell us anything about THC and CBD content. We, we really need to understand this a lot more before we um, jump to conclusions that uh, cannabis and immuno, cancer immunotherapy are strictly contraindicated. I think there's gonna be a lot more to it. Um, and it looks like Amy Silverman asked me another question about uh, cancer immunotherapy. Wow. So I think we're um, probably good, good with that. We've done enough of that. Uh, let's see, Deborah Kalik said, um, 
she's 69, osteoarthritis uh, that I've spent a good uh, part of my day trying to manage my pain. Started to get severe two years ago. I use a combination of CBD, THC, and Advil. I may have noticed that Advil doesn't work as well with THC. Does this make any sense to you? Um, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So there, there is a little bit of data looking at a drug that's similar to Advil called indomethacin. And that drug has shown that um, it goes in the other direction where indomethacin uh, can prevent uh, or decrease some of the effects of THC. But I'm not sure of uh, evidence that THC could decrease the effects of um, Advil or ibuprofen. You know, as I say that, I am thinking up ways in which it could do that by, you know, if someone's over, it's just so theoretical, but I'll, I'll show you how I think. If someone's overusing THC and downregulating their CB1 receptors uh, and having higher production of endocannabinoids in order to, um, you know, in order to stimulate those receptors, they may be upregulating the COX enzymes. Uh, and those, because those COX enzymes aren't just involved in um, inflammation, you know, th those are the targets of the non steroidal drugs like Advil and uh, indomethacin, but they also are used to break down endocannabinoids. And so there, are, there is an interaction in that system uh, where endocannabinoid levels are related to COX uh, activity. And, and that's the target of, of Advil, but I don't, I don't exactly know how THC would decrease the effects. Interesting question though. Um, where are we going next? Uh, my husband suffers from neuropathic pain, thalamic pain following a stroke four years ago. He takes THC medicinally prescribed along with pregabalin. Uh, these help control his pain but do not eliminate it. Are any other cannabinoids or terpenes that might help him? We are in Canada, so we have access to cannabis products. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty much all of the above in treating neuropathic pain, the largest body of evidence is looking at a combination of THC and CBD. So if he's just using THC with no CBD, I would put the CBD in there. It'll probably raise uh, the, uh, you know, widen the therapeutic window and allow him to take more of both because it mitigates the side effects of THC. And then as you know, I would put THCA and CBD in there for the, for the anti-inflammatory effects and uh, hopefully that could help uh, promote some nerve healing. Um, okay, yeah, we did get a lot of questions about immunotherapy, but we've, we've just covered that so much that I think, uh, let me go over here. Um, is there a, uh, let's see, we got the breast cancer question. So for Melissa Harvey, is there a recommended CBD and or CBDA dose for someone on the blood, blood thinner Eliquis? Thank you. So there are uh, theoretic drug interactions with cannabis and these newer generation of anticoagulants. I have so many patients that have combined them without any problem. Uh, you know, the problem would be easy bruising or nosebleeds or other types of bleeds and Certainly, anyone that's on that medication is already on the lookout for that. And if you changed your regimen and added cannabis to it and you started noticing more easy bruising, then you know, it's definitely something to talk about with your doctor and, and probably modify something in that equation. Uh, but, um, but I don't see interactions much, and, and we see a lot of patients with that. And if anybody else has a seen or experienced an interaction with those two, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but it is theoretically possible. Um, I didn't catch whether in the immunotherapy and cannabis retrospective study with patients self-report determining the groups, were the groups equivalent with respect to disease stage and disease pathology? Pretty similar, not, not totally matched, uh, but pretty similar. And it, it did look like from my perspective, the cannabis group had a little bit more advanced disease. So that probably, I mean, it's a great, great question, Wendy, and a, a, good, a good catch. Uh, it's not a perfect study. It just shows us a signal, but it doesn't give us a, a strong conclusion. Thank you. Um, uh, so what about, uh, this is from Sharon Knapper. What about brain tumor glioblastoma? So out of all the different types of cancer, it seems like the glioblastomas and the gliomas are the most sensitive or some of the most sensitive to uh, the anti-cancer effects of cannabis. And actually this whole kind of resurgence of cannabis research as far as an anti-cancer agent happened by mistake because glioblastomas 
are really fast growing cancer cells. And so researchers like to use glioblastomas uh, in the lab because they grow so fast, they're easy to work with. And it was uh, Manuel uh, Guzman and colleagues in Spain that were just really surprised when they saw that their glioblastoma cells were dying when exposed to THC. That wasn't even what they were uh, you know, trying to figure out if THC could kill them or not. And that, that led to more experiments. And now we have data on many types of uh, glioma uh, type cancers uh, in animals showing that CBD, THC, combinations of CBD and THC, combinations of CBD, THC and chemotherapy and so forth, all seem to have a additive or potentially synergistic effects. So it's a, it is a type of tumor that I would recommend um, for most people to use uh, cannabis as part of the treatment. So I am here's from Julie Battelle. I am finding THCA really helpful with my traumatic brain injury patients. Does the data support? No, I mean, a tiny, tiny bit of it gets into the brain. Uh, do, do we see that? Yes, we see that. And with our dementia patients, which you, you could think about as not traumatic brain injury, but another type of brain injury, and I think we've had a pretty consistent um, trend here in Maine that uh, even just a little THCA along with the THC seems to make a difference uh, as far as efficacy in dementia. So I, I don't know why. There's a lot we don't know about THCA, um, but um, I hope to find out. Thank you for sharing that, Julie. And if, and if you want to um, speak live and tell us in, in what way it's helpful, or is it just globally helpful, uh, please do. Okay. Next question, Deborah Kirsting, can I select a flower with a higher percentage of THCA to chew and aid with um, MAC lung infection to reverse damage and scarring in my lungs? I understand this was successful in life and mice. Yeah, we, we, we did a few months ago cover this um, study of uh, THCA and uh, lung inflammation. And um, you don't need a higher percentage of, of THCA in your flower. You basically, the fresher the flower, the more THCA it will have and the less THC will be in there. But, um, but it doesn't have to be high potency. It, it's just an, any old flower that uh, is good, good for you. Go ahead and make some tea out of it. And if you don't want tea, just chew it up, go for it. Uh, there will be a little bit of THC in there. And so if it's a big enough chunk of flour, you'll get a THC-like effect. Uh, but you can start with little pieces of it and see what you can tolerate. And if you do make tea out of it, you're going to be less likely to get a THC effect because there's kind of an upper threshold of THC solubility in the water. THCA is much more soluble in the water. So unless you're drinking one of these big ones, uh, and uh, you're probably not going to get enough THC uh, in your tea to really make an effect. Even though I have had certain patients that are super THC sensitive and they can drink enough tea uh, to get stoned. Um, and by the way, if you put uh, anything with fat in it, any kind of milk or anything like that in the tea, then you will absorb more THC, excuse me, more THC. Uh, so be careful with that. We are really getting to the end here. We're going to wrap it up. Um, um, this was a, a Nancy, are there uh, Nancy Sewell, are there oils that are comparable to fish oil to use, like borage, ev evening primrose, olive, or coconut oil? I try to always take an oil with the CBD for sleep, um, but I don't think these are helping me. Great question. I mean, there's kind of two parts to that question. One is like taking CBD or THC for that matter with something that contains fat, uh, a meal that contains fat or a snack, I think would be the best thing. Uh, and that uh, really improves the absorption of it. But as far as CBD for sleep, I think a lot of you know I have um, very mixed results with that. And if CBD isn't helping you with sleep, my number one piece of advice is try THC because that helps a lot of people uh, with sleep that uh, don't respond to, to CBD. I, I, you know, we see CBD gets some people great sleep, wakes some people up, and just doesn't do anything for others. It's it's very unpredictable. Um, I've had a bad reaction to one particular CBD tincture with watery stools and nausea. Never had that before with another tincture. What could be the problem? I have Crohn's. The problem is probably that particular tincture and there might be something in it that's um, allergenic or uh, a toxin or contaminant. I, I really don't know, but um, definitely, uh, definitely don't take that product anymore. And then does Dr. Sulek have any suggestions for THC, CBD, THCA, uh, CBDA for bilateral glaucoma. Great question, Bob. This is covered in the training material. Uh, so 
in glaucoma, there is increased pressure in the eyes, and it's been known for a long time that THC can decrease the pressure in the eyes. We now have some evidence that CBD can increase the pressure in the eyes, not good for glaucoma, and that CBD can mitigate the lowering effect of THC. So um, most of the evidence would suggest that someone with glaucoma should use something with much more THC than CBD in it. Now, there's one caveat there, which is that both THC and CBD have been shown to be neuroprotective, and that includes protecting damage of the retina and the optic nerve. And there's this line of glaucoma research in cannabinoids that looks at um, not just controlling the pressure, because people that use medications to control their pressure, some of them still get damage uh, in, their, in their retina and optic nerve, and the cannabinoids could prevent that damage. But still, I would be um, careful with CBD and glaucoma. I, I would definitely have your eyes checked for pressure. If, you, if, you, if CBD is really useful for your quality of life uh, and it's, it's just helping you a lot, then I would consider checking it, but make sure that you're, you follow up with your doctor and, and your pressures are okay. I think I got them all. Did I do it? I did it. I got all the questions in under two hours. This was a great webinar. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all. Last call for live questions. Otherwise, I will see you next month. And, um, and just thanks again for this opportunity to teach and, and be together. It's really nice to be with all of you. All right, Becca, right at the last minute, the, the door handle question. I see that you, um, you've got one for me. What do you got? Thank you, Dustin. Um, so first of all, I just want to say, I, as a clinician, I love your literature review. Oh my God, it is invaluable. And, 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 you know, my sweet spot is, is exactly what you talked about tonight in regard to cannabis as an entheogen, because um, I use, I do cannabis assisted emotional healing using yoga therapy. And I just, I, what I want to understand is how you actually go about choosing your, um, your citations, which ones you're going to bring up. And I don't remember in the time I've been with you, and it's been a couple of years now, whether you've actually had one about cannabis as a, as, as an, as a ally in, for, for spirituality. Yeah. Um, so how do I do it? So like, basically, whenever something comes up, I throw, I get the paper and I throw it into a folder called Next Webinar Studies which right now has like, you know, 40 papers in it or something crazy. So I, I'm not presenting you everything that I think is interesting. I'm just kind of catching uh, the ones that are, that are the most interesting to me. Um, and there's, you know, it's, uh, I think what that study shows us, the one we, we talked about tonight is that this is a direction of research, uh, you know, of cannabis research and cannabis practice that was like the dominant uh, cannabis uh, direction in like, you know, a long time ago, up until just the last few decades, nobody's talking about cannabis and spirituality anymore, or cannabis and transforming consciousness. And, and as you know, Becca, even though we might not be covering uh, published literature on the topic, we usually try to weave that in because, I mean, I think so many of us here realize that uh, one of the most powerful healing effects of cannabis is the effect it has on our consciousness. No question. And when it's put within a framework, uh, intentional use of, of, of cannabis for that, it's really very powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I'm sure there's more questions. Let's do them next month. I'm going to go home and get some much needed sleep. And I hope you all sleep really well tonight. Have a great autumn and Halloween and all of that. I'll, I'll see you next month. Good night, everyone.